Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Soft Contained Playground and Equipment Litigation. This presentation will define exactly how soft contained playground equipment differs from traditional park department and elementary school playground equipment. Soft contained playground equipment is utilized by the fast food industry in some restaurants. The American Society for Testing and Materials International standard will be cited for the audience. The concept of why fast food restaurants and family entertainment centers place playground equipment within their establishments will be discussed. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission has developed a safety checklist for this type of equipment, and the presenter will highlight some of the more salient points. From his background in the capacity of an expert witness, the presenter will discuss actual soft-contained playground equipment cases he has worked on. These cases involve matters of use zones, no climb netting, protrusion within a slide, inappropriate surfacing, and dining furniture too close to the equipment. He will discuss the concept of supervision and the lack of supervision, which can lead to litigation. Specifically during this program, the presenter will cover the standards specifically developed for this type of equipment, the motivation why fast food companies and entertainment centers place playground equipment into the restaurants, and finally, the typical fact patterns surrounding each case. The presenter for today's program is Mr. Tom Bowler. Over the last 18 years, Tom has served as an expert witness and consultant on over 300 cases for plaintiff and defense attorneys throughout the United States. In 1966, Tom received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physical Education from the University of Connecticut. He earned his Master's of Education from Springfield College in 1973 and received his Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies from the University of Connecticut in 1981. Tom is credentialed by two recognized playground entities promoting playground safety. He is a certified playground safety inspector endorsed by the National Recreation and Park Association, and he is certified by the National Program for Playground Safety. Previously, Tom taught elementary school physical education for 33 years in Vernon, Connecticut. His credentials include high school coaching in his early career. He has been a director of intramural and recreation and sports at a Division III university. Tom was also an adjunct lecturer, teaching at the undergraduate and graduate levels. During today's program, we will take two question and answer breaks. If you have a question, we encourage you to submit it by using the chat or Q&A feature, which are located on the right-hand side of the screen. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out an email with a link to the archive recording of this program, and we do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Mr. Tom Bowler. Tom, the presentation is now all yours. Thank you, Matt, for that introduction. I do appreciate it. Certainly, I, I always uh, enjoy uh, my presentations and working with TASA, I think they're a great organization, and certainly these webinars are very, very beneficial, I think, uh, to the community at large. Uh, as Matt explained, we're talking about soft contained play equipment litigation and equipment, uh, how it differs from the traditional playground equipment. And uh, we're going to go through a quick and dirty uh, hour here of uh, talking about uh, soft contained play equipment systems. As uh, you already indicated, my credentials uh, were up on the screen previously. I, I just uh, like to point out that I enjoy being an expert witness. Uh, my career uh, in elementary physical education has been extended now, and it's a way that I enjoyed my retirement. And I just returned from Denver, Colorado, from my Sport and Recreation Law Association annual conference. And I would encourage those of you out in the audience who are attorneys that have an interest in this area, Sport and Recreation Law, uh, to uh, consider joining that group. And you can go to their website, the Sport and Recreation Law Association, and Google them. And uh, our next conference uh, will be in Kissimmee, Florida next year. 
uh, about this time of the year. Uh, it'll be actually at the end of uh, February and the beginning of March, and uh, certainly an excellent uh, conference on a variety of topics, and uh, one of which is expert witnessing. Uh, without any further ado, I just want to indicate to all of you, I am not an attorney. I'm an expert witness, and uh, certainly anything that I'm going to be giving you today should be construed as, as legal advice, so I have to do that as a, as a disclaimer. Uh, when you're talking about injuries, you can't get away from talking about uh, some graphic uh, injuries, and certainly I'll, I'll be talking about some graphic injuries uh, this afternoon, and uh, certainly I want to warn you about that. Okay, let's get into the typical age ranges for uh, playground equipment for schools and parks. We have uh, a new category, uh, fairly recent, uh, the toddler uh, indication of six months to 23 months of age. And that is something that has uh, been developed in the playground industry and in relatively new in the last few years. We have the preschool, which we've had for a long, long time, which is traditionally two years through five years of age. And then we have the elementary school age of five through 12. Now, you notice there, there's an overlap in that five-year category. And the reason being that five-year-olds sometimes act more like preschool youngsters, and then some older five-year-olds that are at the higher percentile may act more according to their motor development in the elementary school range. So that's why we have an overlap there. It's not 2 through 5 and 6 through 12. There's an overlap where some youngsters in the preschool area who are 5 belong more toward the preschool age category if they're uh, a younger 5-year-old, whereas as we have the 5-year-old uh, category for elementary school, they may put, fit quite nicely in that category as well. That's how traditionally it's broken down, basically, for elementary schools and parks. Uh, now we get into a soft contained play equipment system, which is quite different. Uh, we have a 2 years through 12 years age range in that particular uh, category. Uh, so I just wanted to point out to the audience that uh, certainly these are the age ranges that we're typically looking at. Uh, as Matt did mention, there is a standard, believe it or not, for soft-contained play equipment systems. And uh, this was first approved in 1998 by the American Society for Testing and Materials International. Uh, um, there is an annual book of standards, uh, which I get every year, which is volume 15.11 by the American Society for Testing and Materials International. And uh, I looked, basically, and this is how quickly things change sometimes, I looked in my November 2012 edition, and they listed it as F1918-10, uh, meaning if you look on that fourth line, F, as in Frank, 1918-10, that is the designation number for the standard, 1918, the slash 10-10 means the year of last publication. Looking it up online today, because I was interested in how much the uh, standard would cost you, I get mine with my volume, uh, but I was interested in individual copy. Um, by the way, the individual copy can be secured from the American Society for Testing and Materials International for $59 for a copy of that, what we'll be talking about today. Uh, lo and behold, I discovered that uh, F, uh, Frank, uh, 1918-12, it has been recently updated, so it didn't quite make the edition of the November 2012 edition, so there has been an edition that came out in 2012 over the 2010 edition, so I wanted to point that out to the people in the audience. Well, what exactly is soft-contained play equipment? What are we talking about here? Well, in that particular volume, uh, ASTM F 1918 10, and it would be the same, uh, obviously, in uh, the 2012 version. Section 3.1.29, soft contained play equipment, SCTE, which is sometimes uh, the acronym for it, is a noun, a play structure made up of one or more components where the user enters a fully enclosed play environment that utilizes pliable material, materials, or, for example, plastic netting or fabric. 
Uh, so that's taken directly from the volume and that uh, succinctly defines, I think, for for all of you, uh, what we're talking about here and how it how it differs from regular playground equipment. Now, the Consumer Product Safety Commission also has a little bit different definition, and this came out uh, a few years back, so it's not uh, updated uh, as well as the ASTM version. But they say soft-contained play equipment, SCPE, is a new type of playground equipment, new type of playground characterized by plastic tubes for children to crawl through, ball pools, climbing nets, slides, and padded floor. Well, it's not new any longer. This came out a number of years ago in the 90s, so it's not uh, certainly a new form of uh, playground equipment, but this is an older definition and a little bit slightly different uh, definition than ASTM, so I wanted to give you that as, as well. Okay, here you see the typical outdoor public playground equipment that uh, we're, you know, more or less that if you have children, you, you're familiar with this. And it's a composite structure made up of, of slides, climbing structures. You can see uh, the colorful slide there to the right. You can see the stairs going up. You can see the tan uh, uh, walk, uh, climbing rock wall uh, going up to a, an area of a platform. Uh, this is the typical composite structure that you will see at elementary schools now. Uh, you'll see it at parks. Uh, it's all interconnected, getting away from maybe when we were children, where you had individual standalone modules, such as a singular slide, a uh, singular climbing module, a jungle gym. And these are all sprinkled out throughout the playground and not interconnected. And they found that uh, play would be more continuous and children would get more play if they would connect things together. And this is the, the concept of a composite structure. So I'm just giving you a little history here, a little background, and we'll get into the soft-contained uh, play equipment systems in just a moment. But I just wanted to point this out of exactly how it differs. Here is a typical soft-contained play equipment system. Notice that it's indoors, number one. You usually don't have them outside, but you do on some occasions. You can have them outside. But usually, more likely than not, they're indoor systems. But they, as I can say to you, you can have them outside. Uh, usually, they will go up almost as high as the ceiling. Uh, you will have uh, a variety of crawl-through tubes, such as that uh, one that's a yellow tube that you see in the upper right-hand corner. You will see a variety of nets to keep the children enclosed uh, so they're not falling off of platforms. You will see uh, uh, Bubbles to look through. You will see climbing areas, uh, slides. You'll see a variety of things in the soft uh, contained play equipment systems. Okay, Matt pointed out. To, you know, we're going to go through why do fast food restaurants or entertainment centers have play equipment? And basically, we can break this down into fast food restaurants, entertainment types of family centers where you would go, for example, uh, and have pizza, skee-ball. Uh, maybe there would be a soft-contained uh, play equipment system there. And you also have, have a pay-for-play kinds of systems where you have an entertainment system where you would go there, actually children would pay their money to, to go to this system. So there's about two or three different varieties where the soft-contained play ground systems would show up. And I can't help but throw out that old show me the money uh, line from Cuba Gooding from Jerry Maguire's movie uh, where he was a sports agent. And uh, first Cuba Gooding was uh, looking to hook on to a football team uh, and with the most money they can pay him as, as uh, uh, Tom Cruise was his agent. And uh, that famous line, show me the money. Well, show me mo the money is all about, I think, what fast food restaurants are about and uh, entertainment centers because they have long realized that self-contained play equipment systems translates into money. It's a dollar amount. If you put a system in there, it will increase their sales revenue at dinner and lunch and so forth. And I'll give you some examples in just a moment. But we have to recognize the, the reason or the motivation behind why do Burger Kings, why do McDonald's, why do Chuck E. Cheese, why do all these groups that have restaurants, why do they plug in um, 
playgrounds. And it's a simple reason their revenue will go up, and that's proven by fact. Okay, here are some quick examples I got off the internet recently. Uh, uh, McDonald's in Enterprise, Alabama, their sales jumped uh, by 10% in one year. Uh, Dairy Queen in Waco, Texas, uh, between 8 to 16% sales increase in every month. Another McDonald's in Brunswick, Ohio, they had dinner sales uh, approximately $150, $200 per hour. But when they put in soft contained play equipment, their dinner sales went from six to seven hundred dollars uh, per hour. So you can see the you know vast increase there in their revenue just by putting in equipment. So they realize McDonald's, Dairy Queens, your Burger Kings, your uh, Chuck E. Cheese, they all realize that this is a good way for obviously increasing their revenue. So there's a motivation behind it. Okay, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, which is out of Washington, D.C., and you can go online, it's www.cpsc.gov. You can go online and, and certainly get a lot of this uh, off, off the Internet. I'm just giving you a, a glimpse here of some of the uh, safety things that they advise to check for when you're looking at uh, soft contained play equipment systems. Uh, they're looking at the, the safety netting, which can fray, which can have tears in it, uh, looking at the rope, which could have frays and tears in it, looking at the floor surfacing, uh, certainly that have tears in it. Even your floor surfacing in your deck areas, because they're not traditionally going to be metal like you would have, uh, or plastics, or metal covered with a rubber coating, so it wouldn't get hot on it on a hot day as you're outside, they would be probably more likely than not in uh, fast uh, food systems, the soft contained playground systems, they would be a padded floor. So you have to look for any tears if anybody went in there with a knife and, and uh, tore the, the flooring of your platforms inside your uh, soft contained playground systems. Uh, look for your cleanliness, and we'll get into that more with the ball pits in a, in a moment. Uh, check for safety. Uh, are the uh, patrons uh, observing the uh, guidelines that are posted? Uh, do you have uh, use and size recommendations? Do you have the age posted, for example? Uh, are there any kind of signage uh, relative to removing of jewelry and loose strings, which we'll get into a case in a little while where jewelry was possibly the culprit? Uh, Monitoring children's play at the entrances and exits. How do, how do you monitor their play? How do you monitor children climbing on the equipment? Uh, how do you monitor children playing in the ball pits? For those of you that have uh, children or grandchildren, I don't know the makeup of my audience out here, but for those of you who've been there, it's very difficult to sometimes monitor soft contained playground systems because uh, the children are crawling inside. They're out of view. They're up at various levels, uh, almost up uh, at least a story above your head, at least. And uh, many times they uh, crawl through tunnels. You can't see into them unless they have windows. And you really don't know where the children are. Uh, they're perfectly safe, more likely than not, because it's self-contained. They can't fall off pieces as they can outdoors with the traditional pieces of equipment, as I shared with you previously. However, it's very difficult uh, to monitor, and uh, basically they should be supervised and watched. The equipment will not supervise itself. Okay, here's some typical signage that you would have at a self-contained playground equipment system. Uh, the playground is for exclusive enjoyment of customers. All children must be accompanied by an adult. No food or beverage allowed in playground area. No smoking in playground area. I think that certainly goes without speaking throughout the United States now with uh, uh, restaurants and so forth. Uh, management will not be responsible for injuries due to misuse of playground equipment. And that's the typical uh, line that uh, obviously the management would be giving you. Here you have a, another sign. This is uh, from the McDonald's, I believe. And you notice on line two, 
uh, they're limiting the age range from three years to 12. Uh, and certainly, yeah, uh, they do not stick to the traditional ASTM 2 through 12. And they set it a little bit higher, and they restrict their rules to somewhat higher. Uh, also, in some venues, they will not only use an age restriction, they might use a height restriction. And height sometimes might be a better way to categorize children than by age. Age is certainly not the best criteria to uh, to judge children by as far as their uh, ability to play. And sometimes height would be a better uh, yardstick to use, certainly, pardon the pun, but uh, certainly to use uh, over uh, just a chronological uh, years. Uh, no socks are required. Please, no shoes and so forth, no running, uh, no toys, no food and drink again. Of course, food and drink, if you bring that into a soft contained play system, uh, it's just a nightmare for the management because if you're spilling sodas, if you're spilling ketchup, if you're spilling uh, burgers and whatnot, pickles and whatnot, that's just going to be a mess for someone to go through that whole area and to clean up afterwards. And the management will literally have to crawl through and do the cleanup. There's no other easy way than to do that. So uh, certainly, uh, signage is very, very important in uh, player systems here. Here, I know you can't read that, but I, I know uh, you probably read the top line. It says, welcome to Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, certainly, I want to point this uh, particular slide out because it's, uh, it's important from the standpoint of uh, security and what we do with uh, uh, students and children at uh, a place like a Chuck E. Cheese. And I think that they, they do it right from the standpoint of uh, uh, securing their uh, patrons that are coming in. As I understand it, as I had a case at a Chuck E. Cheese, that's why the slide is in there. Uh, from what I understand, you come in and you present yourself at the podium to the uh, receptionist. At that point in time, the child gets a bracelet and the parent gets a bracelet and you're matched up together. Uh, there will be times when the child will be away from the, the um, parent and they'll be eating pizza or whatever they're doing. And But by the time you leave, you have to both show your bracelets. So they would have to match up the parent and the child. So it's a security type of signage that they're using and you're not allowed to leave unless the child matches up with the parent. So I think it's a very, very good way in today's world with molestations and so forth and kidnappings and so forth. It's an excellent way for uh, children to uh, be safe at an establishment like this. And certainly I don't see that at Burger Kings. I don't see it at McDonald's and so forth. But Chuck E. Cheese, I think, is, is doing it right by the way they're doing this security with a bracelet. Uh, it's a little bit different kind of venue, perhaps, than your quick burger place. If you're getting pizza there, but you probably stay a little bit longer at Chuck E. Cheese than you would a typical, typical McDonald's or a uh, Burger King. But I think uh, it's worth pointing out. The other thing I'd like to point out that it says on the podium there, again, the font is so small, I know you can't read it, but trust me, it does say that they have security cameras in use. Uh, so the patron has to be aware of that. Uh, so certainly this is an excellent, excellent way to uh, monitor what's going on with cameras in, in use. Uh, so certainly uh, I, I would think that uh, Chuck E. Cheese is doing it right with the uh, security system that they're using. Here you have Vermont state law requires socks to be worn at all times. So you have state laws that come into to view that uh, uh, are superimposed sometimes on the establishment. So I wanted to point that out. And if you didn't have the Socks, they're going to give you a pair for, not give them to you, but for $1.25, they're going to uh, have you buy a pair at the register. At this point in time, uh, I'd like to entertain some, some questions, perhaps, and uh, we can have a question and answer period before we get into some of the actual cases. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have a, a general, question, uh, general question about a specific case from Jeremy who asked, um, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today is, is based on uh, uh, play equipment that is, is inside of the restaurant. Um, do the same sort of principles apply to equipment that's uh, outside of the restaurant, or is that just a whole different ballgame? 
And do you have experience uh, yes in that area? Right. Yes and no. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, soft contained play equipment can be outside. Uh, I live on Merritt Island, Florida, and we have a fast food establishment here uh, with burgers, and uh, they did have a soft contained play assist system on the outside of the playground. Since we're so close to uh, the Kennedy Space Center, it was in the motif of, a, of an airplane where children would climb through tubes and so forth, and they recently removed that from this establishment. For whatever reason, I don't know but it probably was just old and they, they took it out. So that was on the outside of the establishment. So you can have soft-contained playground equipment on the outside. You could have it on the inside. In relation to Jeremy's question, uh, it does differ, and we'll get into it in a little bit, because you get into uh, different kinds of nuances with your soft-contained playground systems that you don't have with your traditional equipment, your public equipment that is found in parks and playgrounds and so forth and uh, elementary schools. And that is you get into evacuation routes, you get into electrical codes, you get into fire codes that you don't get with the, your equipment outdoors uh, and your traditional elementary and uh, uh, you know, playground equipment you find in parks and elementary schools. Uh, so that's how, how it would differ basically, although the projections, the protrusions, uh, the uh, entrapments, uh, the surfacing, many of those generic things are the same throughout. So you, the, this model that was developed, the uh, F1918 uh, from American Society for Testing Materials, uh, was uh, a spin-off of many of the things that were taken from the playground uh, specification that had already been developed for outdoor equipment. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, just to follow up on that, um, when, when going back to uh, playground equipment that's found inside of a restaurant, um, do you find that um, injuries can happen both inside the equipment and outside of the equipment? And how should uh, restaurants try to mitigate that? Right. It can happen. Uh, it shouldn't happen that much on the outside of the equipment if it's self-contained. There are going to be some accessible routes and some freestanding devices that can be out there, but uh, certainly uh, with the self-contained play equipment systems, there shouldn't be as many injuries. In fact, uh, going on the Consumer Product Safety Commission's uh, site, uh, you can't find as many injuries, I believe, in this type of equipment as you can uh, in the outdoor equipment. And probably that's just specifically because there's more outdoor equipment out there versus your soft contained playground systems. But uh, I did do some uh, some work looking at that for just a specific age category, and uh, it didn't seem like there were that many injuries. Uh, there was a study done between uh, October 2000 and September of 2001, and they looked at uh, the ages of 12 months to 23 months of age. And, that was 95% of the injuries, and I believe the other 5% was 11 months or younger. Mm -hmm. And looking at that uh, little study they did back uh, a number of years ago, uh, they were looking and comparing it with park equipment, apartment complexes, schools outside, daycares, and so forth. And the traditional numbers of injuries seem to be not in the fast food injury in industry, but in other areas. So in answer your question, that uh, certainly... Uh, and that was just one for one specific age category, the lower age category. There would seem to be more injuries uh, uh, on other outdoors types of equipment. Uh, that is, your daycares that are outside, your park equipment outside, your elementary schools outside, and uh, uh, the soft contain don't really have that many injuries in comparison, I don't believe. And as far as mitigating the injuries, certainly uh, it does help uh, having the netting, and certainly I think this is a safer form because children are not going to fall from decks, and that's traditionally where you get the accidents in outdoor playgrounds when from falls, fall from the surface. Okay, great. We have a question here uh, from John who asks, in light of the huge increase of sales, such as from $200 to $700 an hour for dinner at a fast food restaurant, should the restaurant have a dedicated minder overseeing the play equipment? And if so, does this usually happen? Uh, I didn't catch your ass where it's dedicated. 
Uh, d- d- uh, should a should a restaurant have a dedicated mind minder overseeing the play equipment? And if so, does it usually happen at a restaurant? Is there an overseer during the busy times? Right. Uh, I don't see that that happening. Uh, uh, certainly, it's a great thought. I don't think uh, uh, fast food restaurants are going to put their money into uh, someone trained to uh, watch children, but certainly I never have seen that and never come across that, but I'm sure it uh, it can happen. Uh, but certainly by the increase of sales, they're going to get... Uh, uh, increase of the volume of people in there, obviously, and there's going to be more people using the equipment. Uh, one would suspect, at least, to draw that to conclusion. But uh, certainly, that that is a good suggestion, and I just don't see it uh, don't see it happening in practicality. But uh, it's an excellent suggestion because the supervision has has to be there. Of course, the management would turn around and say, "Well, uh, you know, it's up to the parent to supervise," and uh, I, I don't quite totally agree with that. Uh, uh, certainly, I think it's incumbent because it's uh, a business invitee relationship. I think the uh, establishment certainly does owe the patron uh, some uh, supervisory uh, caregiver duties if they're uh, taking in money uh, from the from the patron. Okay. And to follow up on that question, Tom, what is the best time for an expert to inspect self-contained play equipment at a fast food restaurant? Okay. Uh, normally, they would be closed in the early morning hours unless they're serving breakfast, which many of them are doing now, as we know. And uh, from my experience, uh, uh, I would ask, if I had to go to a, a fast food restaurant, I would ask for a, a morning, uh, maybe if they had a morning breakfast of 7 to 9, that they're busy, I would ask to to go somewhere between maybe 9 and 12, and certainly when students are in school, uh, more likely than not, uh, if I had to do an inspection, because that's the time when I would be able to get in there. There would be hopefully no children in, in the area. Many of these uh, fast food establishments, a separate room, it's glassed off. They can lock the door. Uh, if I had to go in there, it inspected, I would request a, a two or three hour window, maybe uh, would it would impact their business hours, would it impact their uh, patrons coming in and using the facility. And I think that would be the best time. When you get into lunch and dinner kinds of situations when kids are out of school, uh, it would impact the uh, patrons coming in there. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation? And for all the attendees, we will be taking a Q&A break at the conclusion of the program. So if you do have additional questions, please feel free to submit them uh, either through the chat or Q&A feature. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move along and, and talk about a specific case that I had a number of years ago. Um, and it involved a protrusion uh, by that, I mean a, a bolt that was sticking out too much uh, inside a slide. It, uh, it wasn't on the face of the slide. It wasn't snug up against the slide. It was uh, just some facts here. It was a grandfather. He was 59 years of age, and he went to a family uh, entertainment center. Uh, by, by that, I mean ski ball, uh, pizza, ice cream. Uh, and off to the side, they had a soft contained play equipment system. Uh, the father went into the SCPE, the, the system, with his grandchildren. He was kind of following them around, and, of course, he had to go through a series of tubes and a ball pit, and, and then ultimately up at the very top, there was a, as you'll see in a moment, there was a tubular slide. Um, they were actually filming this as a family outing. They had their videotape camera running, and he went down the slide, and I saw it on the, the first, they sent me the actual video tape because I was the plaintiff's expert witness, and they sent me the actual tape of the uh, father with the excursion of going through the series of uh, uh, crawl-throughs and slides and so forth, and it's almost like back to the future. You know what's going to happen. You almost want to tell him, don't go down the second trip, because unfortunately, and this gets a little graphic now, uh, here is the tubular slide from the outside. It was a fairly steep drop, 
as you can see. And you can see perhaps, uh, if you look very carefully, three circles, and they're circling carriage bolts. Now, this is on the outside, but you'll see the inside in a moment. And this is where the attorney circled them. I did not do the circles here. The attorney circled And this is where we suspected the carriage bolt that was at fault uh, was the one that uh, snagged the, the uh, grandfather. What happened was he was sliding down, and he was running his hands, his palms, in an upright, outward fashion along the uh, inner core of the slide, and his ring finger on his left hand caught a carriage bolt, unfortunately, and you can see here I, I pointed to a carriage bolt, you can probably see it's how it's raised out at the head of it uh, from the slide, and his left hand sliding down, and it's just the luck of the draw, that ring caught on that bolt, and the drop where I'm Picking up and looking, that's me with the ball head. Uh, and it's a steep drop there, and the momentum carried him down to the bottom, and he amputated his finger, his ring finger. Uh, and uh, just a tragic, tragic accident. The film was running, and you hear the, I believe it was his wife, doing the filming of the family. He was following the children through the maze of the tunnels and so forth. And when he came down, you hear this gasp, and the wife says, oh, my God, and then the camera just goes blank. It was just a tragic, tragic uh, incident. So I was hired and retained as the uh, expert witness for, for the attorney and uh, had to go to this particular uh, New England state. I won't mention the state or the town, and uh, had to uh, investigate. And even several months after it had occurred, you could still see there was no maintenance. They didn't snub up that carriage bolt. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about a carriage bolt, it's a bolt that has a round head that looks sort of like a button. And when you, it's very, very tight. It's, it's not like a hex head nut to it, uh, where you have a hex head bolt, where you have a, a raised bolt with six sides. This is a round kind of button. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a carriage bolt. But nevertheless, it was raised and it was just in the wrong location for this gentleman at that time and he lost his finger, his ring finger. And I actually talked to him and uh, he had played the piano and he had these phantom kinds of sensations, I guess, when you do lose a digit like that, that he felt he, he was still playing or whatever uh, when he was playing the piano. So it was a very tragic accident and, and a needless accident because if they had maintained it, had inspected it, saw this bolt was raising out, they could have gone on the outside, as I showed you before the uh, previous slide, and they could have very easily, in the previous slide here where these were sticking out, they could have tightened them up on the outside here, drawn them more in with the, the nut and tightened up the, the bolts, and it would have never occurred if they were doing what they should have been doing in inspection. But unfortunately, there you see... And, the bolt was raised. And it was very difficult for me to uh, get close to the inspector because I'm at the top of the slide, you're looking down. But once you got down and tried to look at it, my weight would carry me down. And I went down several times, coming kind of around, I'll go all the way back up again uh, to get pictures of it and to actually see how far it was away from the uh, surface of the inner surface of the slide. Here you see, I'm just taking a, a, a typical spark a plug gauge that you'd use for a car, the various blades, if you're familiar with that, and I'm putting the blade underneath to show you how much of a gap it was there, and I, I forget what the, how many uh, hundreds of an inch or whatever it was, but there was certainly enough to get a blade of a spark plug gauge underneath it to show you there was a definite gap there. There should be no gap, really, uh, between both. This is what we call, in the playground industry, it's called a hook. Basically, you have between your surface and the uh, head, there's a space, and that's what is called typically in the industry as a hook. It can catch something. It can snag clothing. In this particular case, it, it snagged a wedding band. And here you see in this particular case, case one, the elliptical shape of the, the ring. Uh, it's not round any longer. It's out of round and it's elliptical in shape. 
uh, exhibit number 18. Here you see even a closer view of the ring that the attorney presented to me. Uh, and you actually can see that yellow arrow is painting to, pointing to some etching where it was actually scratched by the, the, the bolt going down. Uh, so he hooked it, and then it actually made a, uh, an impression on the in, inner core of the of the wedding band itself. I actually had the wedding band in my possession and uh, sent it back uh, to the attorney, but he was uh, gave me permission to you know use it and photograph it once I had it in my possession for a number of weeks. Here you see in this particular uh, uh, slide. Uh, the height restriction and jewel restriction in this particular case. Uh, so we can get into something from the defendant's point of view. For me, it was a, a plaintiff case, but, but uh, no one over 48 inches in height should be going into this uh, this area. Uh, all right, so you can say, all right, the grandfather certainly over four feet tall. Or he shouldn't have been there in the first place. And then you can also point to the issue if you're a defendant in this case, uh, no jewelry should have been uh, allowed. Uh, of course, you know, misspelled jewelry, as you see. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, is a wedding band something that you would consider jewelry? If you look at the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, and their safety notations, more often than not, they're talking about loose jewelry. They're talking about loose hanging strings. They're talking about jewelry that could get caught, get caught in play. You don't normally think of a wedding band, first of all, of removing it when you're going into a, a system like this. A, a grandfather or a father wouldn't be taking off his wedding band, or a, a mom or a grandmom wouldn't be taking off their, their engagement ring in, in wedding bands and so forth and putting them aside. It's something that Sometimes you can't even get them off because your knuckle is too big now. You can't get them over that knuckle. So it's not something that uh, you'll be taking off, first of all. And secondly, uh, it's sort of contradictory uh, information here because at the same time, you're saying out of one side of your mouth, well, you must supervise your children. And the only way in some of these systems that you can supervise is physically getting in there yourself and following the youngsters. And that's what this gentleman was doing. Uh, in this particular uh, scenario. So he didn't see the signage. That was his testimony, I believe. He did not see the height restriction signage. Uh, however, we can certainly, from the plaintiff's point of view, indicate that the owner did not enforce their own rules. The concession stand facing that signage that I just pointed out to you in the slide previous was only 14 feet 4 inches away from the entrance to the play area. There they, I believe you'd have to come and place your order probably for pizza or whatever, and uh, it was uh, only uh, under, just under 15 feet away. So they were certainly the uh, person receptionist at that desk uh, was looking directly at the uh, play equipment system, and if there was an issue of a grandfather that they didn't want in there, it was certainly up to them to tell them, sir, you're not uh, attending to our rules, you're not allowed into the system, I'm sorry. Uh, please refrain from going in with your with your grandchildren. Uh, yes, he didn't remove the jewelry, uh, but again, as I said before, you don't normally expect uh, a, a grandfather, a father, mom, grandmother uh, to remove jewelry, at least uh, not wedding bands and so forth, when you're you're playing with your youngsters. You just can't remove them sometimes because of of the situation. Loose jewelry, yes, that would be something that you should be for safety removing. So there was conflicting signage there, monitoring to your children at all times, uh, basis versus the the height restriction, which would preclude obviously uh, most adults uh, from going in. If you're certainly uh, 48 inches, would preclude most adults from actually entering into the system. Uh, the nature of this equipment, I certainly believe, you must monitor internally with these soft-contained play equipment systems. That's a given, given. Let's go into case two now. I don't have a, a, a picture for this one, but you'll just have to take my word on this. It was a boy at age five. It was a plaintiff case for me again. Came down a slide. 
and he has had enough picnic table, and he had a severe laceration with profuse bleeding. He was taken away by the ambulance, and it required only seven stitches, but certainly to a mom or a dad, that, that's significant. And there was conflicting facts concerning what the boy was doing. I believe one uh, set of facts indicated he was running down the slide, which certainly would not be uh, a safety uh, type of uh, activity you'd want a boy to be doing. Uh, you would want him to be sliding down on the seat of his pants, not certainly running down the slide. So there was some conflicting uh, information and facts of what exactly he was doing. Uh, certainly, I point this case out, case two, to you because uh, benches and equipment should be far enough away from uh, slides and from the soft contained play equipment systems. Picnic tables or where you have the place where you eat in the restaurant shouldn't be smack dab up against the uh, play equipment. So I point that out to point out a use zone violation. Normally, for a use zone, you would have in soft contained play equipment systems where you enter and so forth, where there's any kind of activity where you're getting on and off egresses, uh, entrances, and so forth. You would have to have uh, basically five feet or 60 inches. That would be for your soft contained play equipment systems. However, going to your traditional outdoor systems, uh, you're talking about public parks, elementary schools, a little different there. For stationary equipment, generally speaking, generally speaking, it would be six feet for a use zone uh, or 72 inches. So a little bit difference here as far as uh, what your use zones would, would be, one versus the other. Now we have to point out that not all indoor equipment is soft-contained play equipment. This happens to be uh, at a uh, Actually, a, a playground indoors, but it's using outdoor equipment, and uh, it was uh, unique in that it was a, a, an establishment that uh, had a, a restaurant, and the restaurant uh, was uh, divorced from where the play equipment was. It had a tile floor, a rubberized floor, uh, but uh, again, this is not certainly soft-contained playground equipment. This equipment could have been outside just as well. It doesn't fit the definition as I presented earlier to you. And here, uh, there was an accident. The uh, parents uh, uh, allowed this youngster to go inside and to run around and whatnot. And you can see one of the climbing ladders here was off a park bench. You can see just a leg of that park bench at Exhibit 23. And certainly that was not within the uh, scope of a good use zone, and uh, the measurement there was somewhere, I guess, in the vicinity of four feet or thereabouts, and uh, it was not uh, certainly uh, prescribing to either the soft-contained playground equipment systems uh, use zone nor the outdoor uh, traditional public uh, uh, playground systems that we talked about just a moment ago, 72 inches. So certainly, whichever standard you use, it wouldn't... Uh, uh, subscribe to, to either of those. But again, an outdoor piece of equipment, indoors, but not really uh, conforming to the ASTM standard of uh, the soft contained playground equipment system. And the fact pattern in this particular case, the girl was four years old and she actually had her nose on that park bench and she sustained a laceration right to the bone. Excuse me, there was a question of supervision. Excuse me, Tom, you're fading a little bit. I don't know if you stepped away from your speakerphone, but you're kind of fading in and out a little bit. Okay, I'll put it a little closer. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah, that sounds a lot better. Okay. Uh, the the girl hit her uh, nose on a park bench, and it was a laceration right to the bone. Uh, there was a question of supervision in this particular case uh, because the mom was on the outside of the glass, and they had a table right at the glass, a, a group of people looking on the inside. She actually had her back to the, the glass enclosure. Uh, there's a question I had of the age appropriateness of this particular playground system because I really felt it was a 5 through 12 year old system, not uh, something that would be appropriate for a 4 year old girl to play on. There was lack of signage there of the age appropriateness. And the question of 
with a park bench on the inside, so so close, obviously, within a use zone. But again, an outdoor public playground system that really did not conform to the ASTM uh, standard uh, because it was not a soft-contained playground system. Um, this phase four, I do not have a, a slide for you. I have one a little bit later, but it wasn't of the actual case, just to point something out. Uh, but the fact pattern was in this unlocked maintenance area that a child got injured into a restricted area. If you've ever been to uh, a soft-contained playground system, you will note that uh, there will be a padlock door somewhere around that system where a maintenance person can unlock that and go inside and clean up and uh, it's certainly not accessible to children. And uh, as you see in section 8.1.1, users shall not be able to exit from the contained equipment except at designated access and egress points. And that's taken directly from the, from the uh, volume. And also, there's another section, 11.8.1, the owner operator shall ensure that all gates leading to inaccessible areas are locked at all times. And that's a maintenance concern. You have a lock gate, and they will go in there and clean up, and it's really on the outside of this equipment, and students or children don't have any access to it. In this particular case, the case I had, it must have been unlocked because somehow a child had fallen from an outside piece of equipment that really uh, had no, she had no access to. So I point that out that each of these systems should have a door that's, that's locked with a padlock, and the only person that has that access would be the management. And here you see the typical space that you would have in between maybe a wall. Uh, this doesn't happen to be a, a padlock door, but it would be something of this nature that you would have under number eight where this yellow arrow is going, where that would be a door, it would be padlocked, and you would be able to get uh, around in the back but to do your cleaning and so forth, and children wouldn't have access to that. Here you have a rug, actually, the, the crayon rug, uh, which is typical uh, for a, a particular establishment. I won't mention which one. But you also have uh, some of these uh, motorized uh, toys that uh, uh, you can you know, sit on and so forth, put coin operated, and they, they bounce around, move around. And that was uh, in close vicinity of this soft contained playground system, and you can see only about three feet away or thereabouts uh, from uh, the wheel of that system to uh, this soft uh, red bench uh, where number 14 is located. But in this particular case, where you see behind in the purple in the uh, netting, a girl was climbing up that netting. But the case I want to point on number five here is the inappropriate surfacing, certainly, in this particular case was, was the culprit. Uh, Case five, the fact pattern involved uh, surfacing and supervision, uh, involved uh, a non-climbable net, what we call no-climb net or mesh. Uh, and she was climbing uh, halfway up. And the reason for no-climb net, it's a very small net. And it's very, very difficult to get your toes and your fingers in there to actually climb on it. There wasn't any, si there wasn't any signage at this particular establishment indicating the age range for the user. The child fell backwards onto the flooring after she was uh, climbing up the, the uh, mesh. And uh, she fell onto the flooring and uh, injured herself. And uh, the, the uh, carpeting was a cut pile. It was only 0.34 hundredths of an inch in thickness. And the con concrete was underneath that. So that's certainly not an appropriate surface, certainly, where you have an, an egress and entrance area and so forth. Uh, so uh, the, we really felt in this case it was a plaintiff-driven plain case for me that the restaurant staff had an obligation uh, to come in and to do some supervision there. As we had a question from the audience previously, we you know talked about you know do they have an obligation and they do to a certain extent, but we don't find them actually monitoring unfortunately. But certainly, they have an obligation. If they see something that's wrong, they should intervene. In this case, intercede and say, "Hey, get down off the off the netting. You're not allowed up there." Girl didn't know. Uh, she didn't know that you could not climb the outside of the netting. You know, children don't know if you don't tell them. They just assume that, "Hey, it's all free for all. Everybody 
they can climb anywhere. And she really didn't know, and she fell backwards onto the flooring. In this particular case, there was another supervision problem. The mom had left her there and went to the Walmart uh, next door. And she had left the child in trust of, I believe, a 14-year-old as the supervisor or babysitter. So, again, here's another problem coming in here with the supervision fact that you're leaving older kids in charge and certainly not probably the best uh, thing to do. Uh, I use this case sometimes, uh, this McDonald's case. And here you see a typical self-contained system on the outside of the McDonald's. Uh, and it would fit the definition of a soft-contained plate equipment system. Uh, and these are the, the facts. I, I got this through an email. A state trooper was on his vacation with his family, and he stopped at the McDonald's. And uh, the kids in the trooper went inside the slide. Right? And then, unfortunately, when he went down the slide, uh, the children and, and himself, they were soiled by feces and urine on the inside of the slide. And I usually ask when I'm going out lecturing uh, with college students and so forth, we're talking about just the basics of, of law. Do we really have a lawsuit uh, in this particular case? Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, as far as a duty, was there a duty for a you know, clean, hygienic, safe environment? We'd have to say yes. Uh, was this breached? Obviously, we'd have to agree it was breached. Uh, proximate cause, they went down a slide and got soiled. But we really don't have any physical damages other than... Yes, we do have some soil clothes, which can be replaced, uh, but we don't really have any broken bones. We don't have any uh, fractures. Uh, certainly, do we have a lawsuit? In this particular case, uh, I referred the state trooper to a few attorneys I knew within this particular state I'm talking about, and he never came back to me, uh, asking me to be the expert witness on, on the matter. Uh, I, I really believe, uh, we don't know when the the, the the soiling of the inner part of the tubes in the slide occurred. Uh, does the establishment have a, a duty to uh, check on this every five minutes? If it happened, say, an hour ago and they were just about ready to check it again, you know, you go into a McDonald's, you go into a Burger King, if you go into the restrooms, you will see a sign on the exit door. This restroom was last checked at 9 o'clock in the morning on, on uh, March, you know, 21st, uh, 2013, whatever, and these should be checked out every hour on the hour, perhaps. But do we have an obligation to check the slides uh, every hour on the hour, every half hour on the hour, depending on how, what the frequency of use is? So in this particular case, uh, I use this. And of course, you get into the whole argument of universal precautions. Were they violated? Could he have contracted some sort of a, a disease and so forth? Uh, he was on vacation, so it would be kind of hard to prove. You'd have to have an expert uh, the medical profession to, to prove that. But uh, at any rate, uh, an interesting comment. I, I just use this uh, sometimes to, to point out the four elements of negligence when I'm talking to uh, students in a class. Um, obviously, ball pits do create problems, uh, hygienically certainly, because it's a known fact that unfortunately children do, do urinate in, in ball pits, and uh, certainly they do have to be taken out of there and sanitized in a frequent uh, uh, measure periodically, uh, uh, certainly you have to look for forward objects and children jumping into the pits. Are there other children buried underneath? Uh, they're uh, covering themselves up with the ball. So ball pits create certain problems that you don't normally, you don't normally have. Uh, unique to this concept, and we're almost ready for the last question to answer because my time is up, but as I said before, you get into how this is unique to soft-contained play equipment systems. Uh, you have fire codes. You have electrical uh, code issues. You have emergency lighting issues. You have evacuation routes. For example, if a student gets up inside a tunnel and there's a dead end, he must be able to turn around and come back. But if he has to get out for whatever reason, other uh, egress is blocked, you have to have ladders and step ladders in order to get them up there to emergency evacuate them. So you have to have evacuation routes. The owner or operators, certainly, of these establishments should have training, should have inspection procedures, should have maintenance procedures, should have cleaning and sanitation procedures. It does not indicate in the ASTM standard how often the ball pits should be uh, cleaned. I'm sure your uh, manuals that come with the equipment would indicate that, but it doesn't offer that in the standard itself. So that's basically it in a nutshell, and I think we have 
perhaps a chance for uh, just some questions and answers. So last thoughts. Uh, playground equipment, as we said before, doesn't supervise the children. It's not a tool for babysitting. You need to get the parents involved. I think you also have to get the management involved. Uh, they're constantly in flux. Uh, as I indicated to you, it went from 2010 uh, to 2012 recently. Uh, need to apply the appropriate standard and uh, need to apply the standard which is, is timely for the for the incident at hand. And in the business invitee concept, I think the management has a duty here to obviously keep it uh, clean and safe for, for the proprietor. Okay, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, we do have a couple questions from carryover from the last Q and A session, and I would encourage attendees to, if you do have a question, please do submit it. Uh, Ralph asks, how often should an enterprise inspect the equipment? That's a good good question, and I don't believe it's specifically uh, spelled out in the ASTM standard. That would come with your manual, but uh, from my way of thinking, uh, uh, it should be daily. I would think uh, uh, certainly uh, if you are a Burger King or McDonald's uh, and you're using this, as I used in the example before, with uh, someone uh, defecating and urinating in in a slide, you can't obviously just go a weekly inspection as you might maybe in an elementary school or a park. It'd have to be on a daily basis, and uh, it, it, even if it was getting a lot of uh, certainly use, you'd have to be even more frequent than just daily, maybe twice daily. Okay, and um, what prevention maintenance record should one expect establishments to maintain? Well, as we all know, in, in, a, in a court proceeding, uh, you would want to have a paper trail and uh, certainly a daily log. You would want to see if they are cleaning the ball pits and how frequent they're doing that, how frequent they're going around and tightening up the, the uh, nuts and bolts, as I indicated, that uh, uh, case that I had with the grandfather who was 59 years old. Uh, so you'd want to have a, a certainly a paper trail that uh, would reflect that and you would have to obviously be going around on, on probably a weekly basis at least to, to show that you in good faith were, were doing that and keep good records indicating that you were in fact doing what the uh, uh, manufacturer of that equipment said in their uh, owner's manual that you should be doing. It would vary from manual to manual. And it kind of goes certainly to the, it speaks to the issue of how much use this is getting. I think if it's getting a lot of use, you should be uh, more frequently using it, and you should take uh, certainly uh, good notes and be very specific in your notes to help you if there's a litigation there that develops. And a question from Kathy who asks, what would be a sufficient, quote, unquote, safe flooring for, all, for fall protection with a concrete floor. Okay, you, over a concrete floor, you would want to get one of the rubberized uh, surfaces. You could go either two ways. You could go with the poured in place surface, but it would have to conform to another ASTM standard F, that's Frank 1292. Uh, so you wouldn't have attenuation beyond 200 cheese of force. Uh, and basically, you would go either with a tile floor, again, you would want to have. Uh, attenuation greater than 200 Gs of force. Over 200 Gs of force, the ability of a material to absorb something, when you're impacting, that could cause a serious head injury if you impact something beyond 200 Gs of force. Uh, long bone injuries, we don't have anything to measure long bone injuries, a threshold when they break, uh, certainly, but you would want, uh, certainly over a concrete floor, some rubberized flooring that would uh, uh, and certainly conform to uh, the, the standards within the industry. Okay, a uh, question here from Ralph who asks, have you seen any issues with recycled materials such as ground tiles, the ground tires used as flooring? Um, I haven't seen any issues in soft contained play equipment systems. Ground up uh, rubber tiles uh, or rubber on tires uh, can be used outside. The two issues with that, uh, two or three issues. Number one, it disperses. Uh, I had a case out in Minnesota. It was dispersed on the outside on sidewalks. So it's a maintenance concern. It will burn. If you put gasoline on it, it will burn. Um, and uh, certainly it can be very, very dirty if it's not, uh, if it's uh, ground up uh, tires. So it would not be something you'd want on an indoor system like this, it would be just uh, 
too difficult to uh, keep clean, uh, and certainly uh, you wouldn't have an. You know, I wouldn't think you would have a problem with arson as you would on the outside, uh, but uh, certainly it would be a dirty substance to use the ground uh, up uh, tired. And the other, okay. other thing is ADA accessibility is, is a problem with that, uh, Matt, as well, as far as getting wheelchairs across. Okay, great. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, and this will be the last question from Jamie, who asks, it seems like most fast food, McDonald's, Wendy's, etc., restaurants are eliminating uh, this type of play equipment, and, and all play equipment for that matter. Are you noticing this, and do you think this is the trend? I, I'm, I'm noticing it. I, I saw it here first, as I mentioned, down in uh, down in Merritt Island, Florida, that where they had a, 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 a motif of uh, of a rocket ship uh, because we're so close to uh, uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And I didn't know the reason why it was taken out. And I should ask sometime, you know, what was the reason? It was just you know old equipment or what the problem was? But uh, yes, I think perhaps uh, it might they might be getting away from. Uh, uh, doing that uh, because as I go to other fast food uh, restaurants, I'm not seeing the frequency of use. So I, I stop at another one sometimes on my way to visit our son uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and they don't have one there. And I think it's probably a trend that maybe some of the uh, chains are backing off, some of the franchises are backing off because of maybe the uh, legality of it, the legal liability with it, they're, they're backing off with it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Do you have any concluding remarks that you would like to make? I just want to thank you, Matt. It's been a wonderful experience. I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, I see that our attendees are, are hanging in there uh, pretty well, and uh, I just want to thank them for, for listening to me and uh, putting up with me for an hour this afternoon. So thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you for the effort that you put into the presentation. I think there were some good takeaways that both plaintiffs and, uh, and attorneys uh, learned this afternoon. If you'd like to speak to Tom about a specific matter that you're working on, you can contact us here at TASTA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319, or you can just send me an email. You'll be getting a uh, thank you for attending email from me at 3.30 uh, this afternoon. You can just uh, respond to that uh, email. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out a link to the archive recording of this program. And in that email, I'll include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that was used during today's program. The archive recording of this program, as well as all of our other programs, can be found in the TASA Knowledge Center. If you go to our website, tasanet.com, in the lower portion of it, you'll see a section entitled uh, TASA Webinars. Just click on that, and you'll be taken to a list of our archive recordings. Our next webinar for legal professionals, Wage Loss and Personal Injury Cases, will take place on Tuesday, April 2nd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I sent out the invitation for that program uh, this morning. If you did not receive it and would like to receive it, please uh, send me an email and I'll get you the information uh, by tomorrow. And if you have any follow-up or quest questions or comments, please feel free to email me at mhide.tastanet.com. We do take all of your questions and comments under consideration, and they do help us to produce better programs. So please feel free to, con uh, to contact me at any time. Uh, with that, I will end today's program, and I hope to see you at future TASA events. Thank you so much.